during the days of Moses, thousands of years ago, if you wanted to write something down, you had several methods. One method was to write it on paper, a very crude form of paper. What they would do is they would take papyrus reeds and they would interweave them and then they would take a hammer and smash them. And it was a very, it was the first crude form of paper and you could write on that. The problem was it didn't last very long. It, it would grow brittle, it was old, but it, it was something you could write notes on or, or something to remind yourself of. If you wanted to take the next step up, you would write what you wanted to on leather. The problem with it is you had to get a skin and you had to tan the skin out and then you would write on this leather, but it would last longer than it would paper. So that was a medium form of writing material. The next step up was a metal cylinder. They were mining copper at that time. You would take copper, you'd smelt it, and then you would beat it out into a very thin sheet and then you would inscribe on the copper. You'd take a sharp knife or a sharp awl, and you would inscribe what you wanted on there, and it would last much longer than leather or paper. Problem was, it cost more. You had to find the metal, you had to uh, refine the metal, and then you had to beat it out, and then you had to inscribe it on there. The most permanent type of writing, though, would be on a tablet of stone. Now, there were several ways you could do this. You could find a stone, a piece of granite or marble, and you could inscribe on that. And much of the archaeology that we know of today and the writings that we have from the days of Moses are inscribed on monuments and buildings. Or you could take a clay tablet that was made out of clay, and you could write on it, put it into a kiln, you dry it up, and then it would be permanent. And that would last for a long, 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 long time. And that is what Moses was holding in his hand. God had written on the tablets, front and back, there were two copies of it, and that indicates that it was a legal document. It's not that the first five were on one tablet, the next five were on the other tablet. Instead, there were two copies. And anytime you had a king's document or an official document, you would always have two. One was kept by the king, one was given to the people. It's kind of like if you go to the bank, and you're going to buy a piece of land, and you sign all those papers. They get one copy, you get one copy. So you have two copies of it. So he's got two tablets, front and back, first five commandments on the front, second five commandments on the back, and he's got two copies of them, and he's coming down with the official document that he has from God concerning the covenant that they have made with God. But these Ten Commandments, these tablets, the Bible is very clear to specific, specifically say they were written by the hand of God. God wrote these out. It wasn't Moses dictating, taking dictation. God wrote these out. So what he's holding is the most valuable documents on the face of the earth written by God, given to Moses, confirming the covenant that had been made. The people are down the camp. Halfway up the mountain is Joshua. Joshua is Moses' personal aide. He's waiting on Moses. Moses goes up by himself to the top of the mount to meet with God. He finishes his 40 days. He comes back down. He meets Joshua halfway down the mountain. Joshua said, I I'm hearing something down there in the camp. And I can't quite figure out what it is. Real noisy. It sounds like a war is going on. But it doesn't sound like the cry of victory. It doesn't sound like we're winning, but it also doesn't sound like the cry of defeat. It doesn't sound like we're losing. But boy, it just sounds like a really, really loud party that's going on. A lot of singing, hollering, screaming. We don't know. Maybe people are fighting. Maybe they're laughing. I, I can't quite figure out what's going on down there. So as I've studied this passage, there's so much good stuff here. I could spend a lot of time, but I've narrowed it down to three points I believe God wants us to make. So these are the three points. First, we're going to look at the passion of Moses, the passion of Moses. And then second, we're going to look at the penalty of sin. And then third, we're going to look at the position of faithfulness. Okay, so that's your little outline today. And we're going to start with the passion of Moses. So listen to verse 19. 
It came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and broke them beneath the mountain. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. I know some folks would say, well, it's a sin to get angry. But that's not true. That's not biblical. We can get angry. In fact, I would encourage you at times to get righteously angry over some things. To have some passion. To have a heart about things. But that does not give me license to sin. Even when I'm righteously angry, it does not give me the right to curse somebody out or to righteously say, I did it because I was angry and I sinned. Moses was mad. The Bible says, and this is a very strong word, his anger waxed hot. That means he was burning with anger. His face was red. He was gritting his teeth. I mean, tears were coming to his eyes. He was ready to explode. And honestly, I think I can identify Somebody said last year, well, I think Brother Billy has a temper problem. I said, no, there's somebody on staff that's got a temper problem, but it ain't him. It's me. I'm telling you, as a child, brother, I could explode. I'd get mad. My brother knew every button to push to make me mad. And, and I think football really helped me out because the coaches liked it. Don't you think that I get righteously angry when I hear one of our church members has gone out and gotten drunk? Don't you think that makes me angry when I hear of a husband beating up on a wife? Don't you think I just grit my teeth in anger when I hear of a child, a little baby being abused by the people that are supposed to be protecting them? The Bible says Jesus got angry. He got angry at the vendors who were cheating people in the temple. They had come to worship God and, and they were there cheating them, taking advantage of them. And instead of encouraging them to worship, they were turning off their worship. He got so angry, he took some cords and made a whip and he turned over their tables and ran them out of the, out of the building. Kicked over their tables. A righteous anger is the second cousin to passion. But we should be a people of passion. Amen? Aren't you glad your preacher's got a little passion? That I don't just stand up here and give it a Johnny One Note sermon? People should be passionate. I'm passionate about my children. I'm really passionate about my grandchildren. Sunday school teachers should care about their students. It ought to bother them when somebody falls out. It ought to bother them when a divorce takes place. If Moses didn't care about the people, then he would not be passionate about their relationship with God. I'll give you an explanation. You would think Moses was holding the Ten Commandments. Now, the movie, if you've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston just got mad and threw them down. But that's not what the Bible's saying. It says specifically he went beneath the mountain. He went at the foot of the mountain. Moses, though angry, went to the place where the covenant was made. He went to the foot of the mountain where an altar was set up, where they had ratified the covenant with a sacrifice. He went there and said, you've broken the covenant. You've broken the agreement with God, you knuckleheads. And there he broke them. It's not that he's got... Ah, no, no. He specifically took them to the place. It's like a husband who's had a cheating wife, would say, I'm going to take you back to the church. We're going to go back to the altar where we made the vows. This is where you broke the covenant. Here's the marriage license. I tear up the marriage license at the place where it was ratified. That's what he's doing. And he was angry. Concerning the golden calf, theologians believe that Aaron had crafted a wooden frame. So he makes a wooden frame, he overlays it in gold. So it's not a big solid gold calf, but instead it's overlaid in gold. And Moses takes this idol, this wicked, wicked uh, distraction from God, and, and throws it into the fire. 
So it burns up. The wooden frame burns up. The, the, the gold melts. And he has it, ashes and gold, ground up into powder and cast into the water supply. Now, it's not like everybody stood in line when I got to drink a cup of the water. He put it in the water supply so that they would all drink it. Now, the purpose for this is, is very simple. The idea is the gold is going to be consumed. The ashes are going to be consumed going through. Every, so you drink the water that has the gold and the ashes in it. It goes into your stomach and into your bowels. And suddenly, this I, I, stuff that made the idol is unclean. It's dross. Never to be an idol again. So his purpose was, we're going to make this thing so unclean, it will never, ever be an idol again. You're not going to use it for nothing else. We're going to make it completely unclean. So Moses will confront Aaron, whom he left in charge. And I want you to listen to Aaron's excuses. These are really good, okay? Aaron's going to make excuses for why this happened. So first of all, he says this, everybody's doing it. Low expectations. But, but, but Moses, everybody's doing it. Listen to the scripture. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do unto thee that thou hast brought this grace? What did they do to make you make that thing? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax. I don't get mad, Moses. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. They, they, they're all doing it. They, they're set to do it. Aaron said, don't get upset. You know these people. They're what knuckleheads they can be. They're just sowing their wild oats. What's the big deal? Nobody's perfect. We all sin. See, this is the philosophy of the day. Well, I know my child's going to drink because everybody's drinking alcohol. So I'll just provide it for them and their friends at my house where I can keep an eye on them. I've actually had somebody tell me that. I want to take a baseball bat and hit him in the head. Well, I know my child's going to have sex, so I get them protection and vaccines and provide them a safe place. Well, just lower the standards, why don't you? But that's what we're teaching the young people today. We know you're going to do it because everybody's doing it. So why in the world, why don't you preach abstinence? My parents will be rolling over in their graves. Spinning like a top. What a cop out. But if society tells you you descended from a monkey and you can't control yourself and you think, then you think I, I get to act like a monkey. Because my kinfolks were monkeys. Maybe your kinfolks were monkeys, mine weren't. Because the truth is you can control yourself. God gave you a free will and you can choose. You can say no to that sin. Irregardless of what anybody else is doing. I guess the reason I tend to get passionate is because I have such high expectations for myself in this church. I expect somebody to get saved every week. I expect this altar to be full during the invitation. You know why? Because I've invested in this service. I prayed over you. Before I, before I even knew you were going to come, I was praying for you. I've invested in this. I come with high expectations. I expect... God to do what only God can do. I expect God to save somebody that was previously lost, and we're going to redirect traffic at the gates of hell. Amen? Amen. I expect great things because I've made an investment. Y'all have heard this, but I well remember in Mount Pleasant, Texas, I got a phone call one day, and, and there was a pastor named Brother Ed that pastored a church called Hillcrest Baptist Church in Mount Pleasant, that he called me and said, I, I want you to come do a revival for me. I said, no, Brother Ed, I really don't want to. I, I don't like doing revivals in the same city because, so, you know, if I come over there and preach, I'm going to preach sugar sticks. I'm going to preach my best sermons, and, and they're going to hear them, and, and I'm afraid that some of your members might say, well, we like that preacher, and they're going to come to Delwood, and you, you lose the members. I, I just, I would hate for that to happen. He said, no, 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 don't worry about it. Come on, we want you to preach a revival. I said, I really don't want to. He said, I really want you to come. I said, okay, I will come. So I did a revival for him. And I'm telling you, it was a little bitty church in Mount Pleasant. And, and the first night, I'm telling you, I preached my guts out. I'm sweating. I'm just dry. You know how I get. And invitation, nothing. 
Bless me if you can. Second night, Monday night, nothing. Nobody moved. Nobody responded. And I'm sitting there going, what is the deal? Tuesday night, brother, I'm telling you what, God started moving in some of those people's lives. And the, the altar, people came down with their families and began to pray. And, and, and you could tell people had a repentant attitude. And some of them were crying. And, and we had a great altar call. And I remember, because in, in, in those days, in little churches, what you do is you call on somebody to pray. Like I'd say, Brother Wade, would you dismiss us in prayer? And then me and the preacher would walk to the back so that we could shake hands with people coming out. And what you don't know is that sometimes during the prayer, preachers talk. So we got back there, and, and well, I, I was just so excited because something was breaking loose and people were getting right with the Lord. And, and I kind of leaned down and said, that was a great altar call, wasn't it? And if I'm lying, this is exactly what he said. He goes, they don't mean it. I said, oh, what? He said, they didn't mean it. They'll be just as mean tomorrow as they were yesterday. He had that gravelly talk. And I'm going, why? Why did you even invite me to come? That you have no expectation. That sinners will repent. That people will come and get their families reunited. That people will come and recommit their life to Christ. That, that the lost will be saved. Why? Why are we even having a service if you have that low of expectation? You ought to expect the best out of your children. You ought to say, well, everybody else is doing it. I guess I'll let them do it. No, no. You need to set high standards for your children. High standards for your own behavior. First excuse. Well, everybody else is doing it. Listen to Aaron. This is the second one. This is a good one. They made me do it. For they said to me, make us gods which shall go before us. And as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, what not? We don't know what's become of him. He, he goes, Moses, I just minded my own business. And they came and got me. And they made me make that idol. It's not my fault. They made me create that idol. Not my fault. It's their fault. Not my child's fault. That neighbor down the road. It's his kids. You know what your neighbor down the road saying? It's your kids. When we really examine what Aaron said, he was even blaming Moses. Where'd you go, Moses? We didn't know what happened to you. If you hadn't deserted us, we wouldn't have made this idol. But the truth is, listen to me very carefully. When you stand before holy God, you'll stand by yourself. And you will be personally responsible for the decisions that you have made. You can't say, well, I didn't have a quiet time because my wife, it bothered my wife. My, no, no, what about you? You. Nobody worked your jaws and made you say curse words. Nobody worked your jaws and opened your mouth and poured alcohol down your throat. You chose to do that. And you have to take personal responsibility for them. Third, this is best of all. It just happened. <laughs> this is so good. I mean, li listen to verse 24. And, and I said to them, whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me. I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. It just popped right out the fire. The dog ate my homework. Somebody took my we might expect that excuse from a 10-year-old, but after you pass the age of 11 and living in unrepentant sin, then the question you should ask yourself is, not will this be acceptable to the world, but will my excuse be acceptable before holy God? Is the reason I'm not serving God, the reason I'm not taking one of those boxes, the reason I'm not going on a mission trip or praying for a mission trip, the reason I'm not coming to day of prayer, the reason I'm not going to Sunday school, Will that hold water when I stand in the presence of my risen Lord and look at the scars in his hands and in his feet? 
You see, a lot of the excuses you give me or your Sunday school class or your Sunday school teacher or, 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 or to your husband or your wife, that, that holds water. That, 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 they'll accept it because they're kind and gracious. But you've got to ask yourself, will it hold water when I stand before holy God? Now let's look at the penalty of sin. The Bible says in verse 28, 3,000 men would be slain as a result of this sin. 3,000 men lose their life. And further on, the Bible says that a plague swept through the, through the camp because of the result of this wickedness in the sight of Almighty God. There are consequences to sin. Amen. Can I hear a good amen for that? Amen. There are consequences. If you're going to play, you're going to pay. Somehow, some way, you're going to pay. There's no saying that sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you're willing to pay. Sin is going to cost you. Unrepentant sin, dear Christian friend, will cost you something. And the sobering truth is, though God is merciful and is willing to forgive the, unrepent, the repentant child of God, there's still natural consequences to your sin. The consequences of a promiscuous lifestyle have devastated many a family. Well, it's not hurting anybody, brother. Oh, yes, it does. It does hurt people. And it's going to hurt you. Unplanned pregnancies, broken families, broken trust, broken hearts, and the consequences of substance abuse can be both heartbreaking and deadly. God placed boundaries on our behavior because he loves us and wants the very best for us. Physically, mentally, and spiritually. And there's always a penalty for sinful behavior. And it costs them. It's going to cost you. If the Holy Spirit's revealed something in your life that you're doing that you should not be doing. Well, here's what great part. This is the position of faithfulness. Verse 26, when then Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. The last thing I wanted to point out this morning is absolutely incredible. It's a testimony of restoration and of God's mercy. Moses said, I need some help. Who's on the Lord's side? I want, I want to see who's on God's side. Hadn't been worshiping that idol. And been dancing around naked, getting drunk. I want to know who's on the Lord's side. And the tribe of Levi responded. Now, to fully understand this, you've got to go back to the book of Genesis. Because in Genesis chapter 34, the Bible reminds us that Simeon and Levi were the sons of Leah. Okay? Leah was the sister to Rachel. They were both married to Jacob. And Leah had uh, Simeon and Levi and also had a daughter named Dinah. So Dinah is taken by a stranger, a person that was not a Jewish person, and uh, was taken advantage of. And the Bible in Genesis 34 says, Levi and Simeon, to avenge the honor of their sister Dinah, literally deceived and slaughtered an entire village without mercy. Said, listen, I tell you what, if you guys are... Join our religion, and if you guys are willing to get circumcised, then we we will accept you. Guys go, okay, hey, what a great deal! We sound like a good deal. We, we we will do that. So they got circumcised, and when they were all sore and they just had their surgery, that Simeon and Levi went in with swords and killed every one of them. Jacob's their father told them. They said, "You've made my name stink in this land." You have ruined my good reputation. I had a good name here, and you have ruined it. You've destroyed our family. We got to move because of what you've done, this wicked, wicked thing that you've done in your anger. So these are the words of Jacob at his death concerning, because he, he blessed each of his sons. And this is what he said when he got to Levi and Simeon. Simeon and Levi are brothers, instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor be not thou united. <coughs> For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger. 
for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. They are under a curse. Instead of blessing them, I curse them. I really don't even want to fellowship with them. The tribe of Levi was now the black sheep of the family. They existed under a curse. Their future was bleak. But when the call came out from Moses, who is on the Lord's side? The tribe of Levi answered the call and said, here am I, send me. We will stand on God's side. We will take a stand for the Lord, irregardless of what others are doing. Making no excuses, we will serve the Lord. And when they took a stand for the Lord, when they chose to follow the Lord's command, everything changed. When they answered the call, everything changed. They went from being under a curse to being under a blessing. So in Deuteronomy 33, 8, when Moses is handing out blessings to each of the tribes, listen to what he says now about Levi. Oh, Lord, you have given your Thummim and Urim the sacred lots. You've, you've given to Levi the position of discerning your will among all the tribes. You have put them to the test at Massa and struggled with them at the waters of Meribah. The Levites have obeyed your word and guarded your covenant. They are more loyal to you than their own parents. They ignored your, their relatives and did not acknowledge their own children. They teach your regulations to Jacob. They give your instructions to Israel. They present incense before you and offer whole burnt offerings on the altar. Bless the ministry of the Levites, O Lord, and accept all the work at their hands. From living under a curse to receiving the blessings of God. My dear friend, prior to you giving your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, you were living under a curse. You were the black sheep. No hope. But to that person who said, I don't all understand it. All I know is that in my heart of hearts, I believe Jesus Christ died on that cross for me. And that he rose from the dead on the third day. And here am I, send me. I don't want to just know it up here. I want to receive it in here. And when the call goes out, who is on the Lord's side? I was not ashamed to say, I am on the Lord's side. Use me. And when you did, listen, when you did, you went, my dear friend, from being under a curse to being blessed of God, a child of God. From the bottom to the top of the rank. Wow. You feel like your life is living under a curse right now? Oh, my dear friend, would you answer the call? Who is on the Lord's side? Irregardless, no excuses. I am on the Lord's side. I surrender my heart and life to Him. I'm tired of making excuses for why I can't. Now I'm going to be saying I can and serving my Lord Jesus from a curse. To a blessing.